ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The show starts in three, two, one, go. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's August 9th, 2021. I'm Gary Furman, the publisher of Canesport.com. Joined as always on Good Morning Kane Sport by our managing editor, Matt Shodell, as we talk about the news of the day. And uh, Matt, really, this is going to kind of be the news of the weekend because it's it was a huge weekend for us. We got to spend a lot of time at a green tree practice field, got to get a really uh, good look, I thought, at the 2021 Miami Hurricanes. And um, we're going to do a separate podcast uh, talking about our observations of the team, but uh, just in general, um, I would say it was just uh, great to be back out there and and great to get a glimpse at what this team's going to look like. Yeah, hundred percent. It was like making up for lost time. You know, we were out there for every single second of practice, the first two practices, uh, which is super exciting. You know, the weather was great, which is good for us. I don't know if it's so good for the team. You know, I mean, <laughs> usually when we've had full access to practice we're sweating we're bringing like bottles of water with us you know we're dying out there but of course we like watching but you know these evening practices 6 to 8 p.m it was like breezy it was cool you know for miami um so you know manny says he's not that worried about the conditioning for the players right now which is good because my conditioning was very good in that con- in those conditions so i was very excited about the weather about watching the team i mean it was a perfect weekend as far as i was concerned for miami football um being able to watch and seeing the guys run around was just great yeah, it was interesting. We did see some cramping issues out there and some guys looking like they're fighting getting into football shape here early in training camp. Um, that's to be expected, I think. There's a difference between working out in shorts all summer and doing the the things that they've been doing and now going out and competing as football players with um, you know uniforms on and helmets on and uh, getting back into the flow of playing college football. Um, but when you factor in the, the, the fact that it was relatively uh, reasonable conditions from a heat standpoint, I think, you know, you and I were kind of surprised to be seeing that a, a little well, bit. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I, I said, I literally said to you during practice when we're watching, I'm like, you know, on paper, this is on paper, you know, Miami's not going to beat Alabama talent wise up and down the roster. Um, but where they are going to beat Alabama is conditioning wise, you know, because they have the advantage of being able to just be in these mid, not that Alabama is cool by any means, but these midsummer conditions, you know, with, with that fast paced offense, um, you know, you think that Miami can maybe glean some sort of advantage from that. But the first two weeks have sort of taken that away from themselves, you know, maybe to shy away from having some, maybe some injuries from fatigue reasons. I don't know. You know, Manny didn't do a great job of really explaining the rationale. He sort of brushed off the question as a silly one. But, you know, to me, they've always practiced either in that mid-morning heat, which is super hot, or in the mid-afternoon heat. They've never practiced at night. Um, we'll see. Maybe maybe Manny knows something we don't. You know, maybe they got in such great condition over the summer, which is what he said, that, that they don't need it, um, that they just can sort of get to work in the evenings and just focus on the task at hand without being too tired. But you're right. I mean, guys cramping up was not a great sign that they were super conditioned coming out of summer workouts. <laughs> you know, especially when a guy like Mark Pope's cramping up. Like, these weren't big guys cramping up, you know? So... I don't know. It, 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 it's a question mark that will be answered in that first game, I guess. You know, if, if, if the Miami players are, um, are gassed by the fourth quarter, this, this will not have been a good idea practicing at night. Well, I, I know Alabama has a very good strength and conditioning program, so I'm not as convinced that there is going to be a conditioning edge there, regardless of uh, what's been going on in the summer and what conditions they've been working on. It, it gets very hot in Alabama in the summertime too. Uh, I think if Miami is going to find a little bit of an edge in this game, it's obviously in the fact that Alabama is going to be breaking in a lot of new personnel on the offensive side of the ball. And the fact that they could still have a national championship hangover, you know, it, it's very, very hard. They haven't had team. that in the last six to eight years. <laughs> Why would they have it this but there's year? always the possibility. I mean, it's a challenge, you know, yeah. to come out after winning the national title and start a new season. I'm not saying they won't do it quite ably, but um, I do at least acknowledge that it, it is a, a, an emotional challenge to get yourself revved up 
after going through the high of, of winning it all. So we'll see what happens. I mean, I'm not you know trying to build up hopes unrealistically or anything, but uh, obviously, and this will be a recurring theme as we go forward the next few weeks, Matt, uh, Miami's hoping to go up there and be competitive. It's, it's like there won't be anybody expecting them to win the game. They're going to be a three-touchdown underdog going up to Atlanta. But if you're in the Miami camp, you're saying, you know, we got to be much better than that. And we want to make this a competitive ball game. And we don't want to go up there and, and be outclassed because that would obviously not be a great thing for anybody. And it would show that the program has not made progress in the last three years, which would you know not be a good thing. They've yet to be competitive in a game against a quality opponent. Um, other since maybe Florida, the, you know, the season opener at camping world that year. I mean, uh, they were they were competitive. I, I think they caught Florida at the right time that year and, and played a very good game and had a chance to win it in the fourth quarter. But the games since then that, that have been against decent teams have not gone well. So that'll be the mission. We'll be talking about that a lot over the next few weeks as we see how the team progresses. All right, so we'll do a separate podcast talking about the team and what we saw at practice. Um, but I do want to run through real quick some of the stories that are on the website this morning since this is Good Morning Cane Sport. Uh, a story on Zach McLeod. And uh, the big thing with Zach, Matt, is I think as much as him trying to be a starting defensive end, I think as a sixth-year player here, uh, the greatest impact that Zach McLeod can make on this team is as a leader. Uh, I'll go ahead and disagree. <laughs> It's great to have leaders, but I mean, you need a guy who produces a defensive end. They cannot, like, like, okay, let's backtrack a little bit. I mean, I was so impressed these two practices with the DBs and the defense in general held up a lot better than I thought they would against a really good offense, which I think is a great sign for this team. And you know, you mentioned Alabama, and and aside from the conditioning, like a big key for me is the DBs because if Manny's going to be blitzing like crazy to get pressure and make you know Alabama's offense uncomfortable, the DBs have to hold up. And in those first two practices um the third one we weren't able to watch last night but the first two you could see athletically that their dg ivy looks much improved tyreek can stand up um against any physical wide receiver uh, that alabama throws at him the little fast guys i hope they don't try to match up on tyreek he almost looks like a safety out there um and then you got to Corey couch you know al blades will be coming back looking looking fine so um you know even even i'd say dunson had some decent moments um the safeties look good so like that could free up Miami to do some 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 of the blitzing that Manny wants to do. But with that said, guys like Zach McLeod can't be pushed off the line of scrimmage. I mean, if he can't, you know, hold his ground and, and get in the backfield and, you know, not get run over, like, he's 250 pounds. You know, he's going to be going against 320, 330-pound guys. So, yeah, I'll take Zach McLeod, the sack slash run stopper, over Zach McLeod, the leader, any day of the week. It's great that he's a leader, but, you know... Miami needs production. That, that's it, period. And he'll give that yeoman effort. I'm trying to be realistic. You know, he's put on weight. He's got the, up to 250 from, I think, about 235, uh, you know, to try to be ready for the physical nature of the position. Uh, it's hand-to-hand combat every play. He likes that. He, he likes playing defensive end much more than linebacker even, even though he started out for, I guess, five years as a linebacker. Uh, but, you know... I don't know that it's realistic to expect him to be a dominant defensive end. I think if he could be a rotation guy and give them, you know, 20 quality reps a game, something along those lines, I think that'll be a win-win for Zach McLeod. I know he's shooting higher than that. He wants to be an NFL defensive end. We'll see how it plays out. All right. Other stories on the website this morning. Um, we've got Rhett Lashley giving us a offensive update. Um, among the things he said, there's no clear cut number two quarterback right now. I don't think that'll surprise anybody. Uh, he talks a little bit about the Eric King, who has looked very good in the first two practices. Um, we've got a ton of video uh, on the site and also on our YouTube channel uh, for everybody to watch. Uh, we, we had op- you know a lot of access days one and two. That's going to be cut back now. There's no question about it. Um, you know, But it was nice of, of Manny to let us um, have an extended viewing periods and, and, and be able to shoot for 20 minutes each day at practice. Uh, so you've got about 40 minutes of practice field video uh, for you to uh, absorb on the website and on our YouTube channel. 
uh, we got a story on Will Mallory, who uh, got off to a little bit of a slow start in practice. Matt and I were kind of, you know, wondering about that, but then he really turned it on and made some big plays in the latter part of the practice number two uh, t- to show that, that Will Mallory is 100% and ready to go uh, for this season. Uh, we've got a story on Amari Carter, who's starting to get comfortable with that striker role that he's been playing, so you can get updated on that. Um, we've got a story with the Eric King, where he talks about everything. And that interview was actually after practice number one. And um, the thing that was really striking, Matt, was that he clearly went out to practice and with, with the preconceived idea that I am going to take off the first chance I get and I am going to show my team that I am back. And, and he did that and no, nobody missed it, I can assure you. Yeah, I mean the the weirdest part of that whole interview. I mean, look, that was great. I mean, he looked fi- he looks fine, you know, to me in shorts and a helmet. But the yeah. weirdest part of his interview afterwards was like he's insistent, like I'm not going to wear a brace. I will not wear a brace. Like, does he understand? Like, knee braces to protect him is it shouldn't really slow him down. So, like, I don't understand his insistence. It's almost like he's trying to tell everybody I'm 100 percent fine. Um, don't worry about me. But he's already said that a million times. So, like, I, I really want to see, um, you know, when he does get that first contact, how he responds. And I don't understand the insistence about not wearing a brace. I have to think trainers are probably telling him he should wear a brace. So I don't get it. Um, I've been told by other people that he was expected to wear a brace <laughs> in the season. So I don't know. Like, I guess some people just don't like, you know, it's like having braces on your teeth. Some people just don't like doing it. Um you know, offensive linemen wear them all the time to prevent, in, to prevent injuries. I hope he wears a brace. You don't want to have a stupid injury that could have been avoided when the brace holds that knee in position when he gets hit awkwardly on a leg that's not going to be as strong as the other leg. So that, to me, was the weirdest part of the injury. Just wear the brace. Who cares? You're fine. Just wear it so you don't get hit awkwardly on a leg that's weaker and have some other sort of injury crop up that you don't need to have. Like, that was no. the weird part. But everything else, to me, 100% with, with, with Eric. You know, I, I like the way he's moving around and everything. My, my guess is he wore a brace in the summertime and didn't like the way it felt. Yeah, not, and, not that kids like it. Yeah, it's but, there but, for but a reason, here's though. the thing. This is a kid who's coming back for one more world, who's trying to show the National Football League that he could play at that level, period. Uh, you know, a- anything Miami comp- accomplishes this year, he's the ultimate team guy. Obviously, he wants to win championships and things like that. But number one on Derek King's agenda, I think, is, you know, he's got to show the National Football League that he's worth taking a shot with. And part of that is mobility and making plays with his legs. And I could see where if a brace was, was you know, psychologically having an impact on him, was making well, him yeah, yeah, I mean, you do have to get used to it. It's not like naturally running. No, I understand, but, but yeah. I'm just, I'm assuming he was wearing it for a while because there's no way they put him out there in yeah. rehab running yeah. around without a brace. I got to believe, you know, we haven't, you know, we can't talk to the trainers and doctors about that, but I would be shocked if he never wore a brace. So I'm going to assume that during the summer he was wearing a brace and he just didn't like the way it felt. And he decided that when fall camp starts, I'm letting it fly. You know, I got four weeks to get ready for Alabama. It's the biggest game of my life. That's the game I'm going to be judged by. That's the film that the NFL scouts are going to watch. And he's right. I'm sure that's what he's thinking. And he'd be 100% correct. Then I'm inter- interested in what he does against uh, Central Connecticut or, or, you know, or, you know, Duke or whatever. They're, they're going to watch the Alabama tape. And uh, without question, when they evaluate the Eric King. And he his attitude might just be... I'm going to let it all fly. And that's kind of what he was saying to us. And he's not holding back. If he has a chance to run in practice, he's running. Now, I will say this, Matt. I didn't see him run in practice number two, not one time. So I got a feeling, and and this would have been smart on Manny's part, on Rhett Lashley's part, that they said to him, look, you know, we know you want, we know you're back. We know you, um, let's just be a little bit more conservative right now. Let's let, let, let your body work into this. You don't need to scramble right now. You know you can do it. Um, and let these, these first couple of weeks, let's just focus on running the offense and executing the plays and 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 that sort of thing. I'm guessing because he didn't run once in practice number two that I saw. No. Um, so, you know, we'll see. 
uh, how that one goes. But a lot of very interesting, obviously, and topical things uh, are surrounding the return of the Eric King. All right, there's also a story on the website about Mike, with Mike Harley breaking things down, um, liking everything he sees. We have a story with Bubba Bolden commenting on everything going around with the defense and, and the, the, the mindset that the different coaches on the defensive side of the ball are bringing. Um, you'll get a glimpse of the initial depth chart um, as well with all kinds of notes from, from the first two practices, uh, kind of uh, sort of uh, get you acclimated to what this team is starting to look like. And uh, like I said, Matt and I have a separate podcast where we go in a little bit more detail on all of those things. All right, well, it's not all about um, football this morning on the website. Um, <laughs> we also have a couple recruiting stories. Um, something you are going to want to read is the update on defensive end Shamar Stewart. Uh, obviously, one of the uh, top targets in this year's recruiting class, a guy that you would have to say from Miami is a must get. Uh, Matt, he's going everywhere in the country, taking visit after visit. He was just at Texas A&M. Uh, Ohio State, uh, very much in the picture. Many other schools. Uh, your your thoughts in general on where Shamar Stewart is right now? I mean, I felt really good about where Miami stood with Shamar July first. And you know, we're not just talking to Shamar. We talked to people around him, um, his coach and others. Uh, Miami's lost ground. I mean, that's just a fact. They've lost ground since July first, and it's 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 a toss up. You know, um, Texas A&M is very much in it. Uh, if Alabama offers, they will be very much in it. You know, he's got a couple other schools. Uh, we break it down on the, in the story that he's looking to visit in the fall. He's going to go possibly now until February signing day. Um, you know, Miami still has that connection of, you know, it's home. He has friends and family that can come watch his games and be a support system for him here. Uh, he has friends on the team. Um, you know, other programs are trying to show him why he should, you know, that they, th this is their argument, that they're, going to make him a better professional uh, prospect than Miami would. That's how they negative recruit against Miami in this situation. And Miami has to overcome that. I mean, Miami just had three defensive linemen go in the first round of the draft. They can't let that happen. If they lose Shamar Stewart, um, there's, there's just really no excuse for it. I mean, they should get Shamar Stewart 100 times out of 100 times with the connections and the guys going off the defensive line in the first round. Like, there, there's nothing you should be able to negative recruit against Miami against to get them to go somewhere else. Um, so this is a huge, huge local recruitment to watch because they're already struggling to get top kids to stay home. You know, you don't want to lose a guy like Shamar. Friends on the team has spent an enormous amount of time on campus five times. And, you know, th things were looking very, very favorable at that point. Uh, but since then, he's taken other visits and other schools are doing a good job recruiting him as well. And um, like you said, it's a toss up. So that's a real interesting update on the site uh, today. And um, another story that I thought was interesting, Matt, is the story of Zach Roll, a, a three-star defensive end from San Diego, California, who's getting daily calls from Jess Simpson. Um, I thought that was really interesting that Miami is recruiting a defensive end from the other side of the country that intensely um, at this point in the game. And, and yes, it is a coincidence that we have these two stories on the same day. It's not that they're not getting Shamar, so now they're recruiting this other guy. That's not the case. Uh, they've been recruiting this guy for a long time, um, but it's just ramped up a lot now. And he'll take an, it looks like he'll take an official visit in the fall. Miami likes him a lot. You can never have enough really good defensive linemen at end or tackle. They've identified him as a really good one. And, you know, the national push continues. I mean, this is a national recruiting class this year. It's not last year's class. It's really not like any class I've ever seen here. Usually, I think it's like a 70% average from, you know, uh, Florida or at least Miami-Dade, Broward, somewhere in that range. This year, it's 0% so far from Miami and Broward and Palm Beach. So, I mean, it's totally different. The quality is still the same, you know, to me or better. You know, I have no qualms or, or worries about it. Um, but it, it is very interesting, the approach they're taking. You know, some people say oh, it's a little bit of a down year overall in, in in Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach for 2022 kids. So, you know, it, it makes sense if you if you buy into that theory. Well, it is. It's a little bit of a down year locally, but there still are those seven or eight kids, Matt, that Miami would like to have. And uh, right now it's not looking great with most of them, but, you know, there's still time. Uh, you know, in the summertime, in the last cycle, you wouldn't have known that they were going to get James Williams. You wouldn't have known they were going to get Leonard Taylor. 
So maybe they just got to hang in there, keep grinding, and see how this shakes out as they go forward here through the season. If they win, they'll have a better chance to get maybe one or two of those kids than if they don't win. So we'll see what happens there. All right, that's going to do it for Good Morning Cane Sport today. Uh, a lot for you to absorb on the website. and We hope you enjoy it all. Uh, so until next time, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>